We are in part three of a four-part series called The New Life, and it, it has sprung up post-Easter as a, a series that reminds us of what it means for us as people who want to follow Jesus. What does it mean that Jesus went to the cross, he, he, he died a sinless death, on our behalf, he was buried and three days later came to life. That event marks history. We live in, a, in our understanding of time, we live marked by that event. And whether or not you believe it, that he died and rose again and is alive even today, seated on the throne, even if you don't believe it, our world is still marked by that historical event. And it's fascinating that, that there is proof of Jesus dying and coming to life, rooted right into how we mark history. And so those of us who do believe it, who have felt like the Holy Spirit has given us the faith to believe that that is true, our lives not only are marked historically by the death and resurrection of Jesus, but they are marked spiritually by the death and resurrection of Jesus. Our lives should look different because Jesus is alive and because he conquered death and death has lost its sting. We should look different. We should be living a new life because of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And so that's what this series has been focused on, and we've been looking at Colossians chapter three. Colossians is a letter written by Paul the Apostle who experienced very radically the reality of the resurrection of Jesus, and his life was marked historically by his encounter with the living Jesus. This letter that Paul wrote to a church, a little church that started to grow in its, in its uh, numbers in a part of the world that is today Turkey, a little city called, well, it wasn't a little, it was a booming city called Colossae, and it was seated right at the roads of like military, you know, the Roman Empire would be pumping its military through there, a lot of trade routes, and so this was a, a booming city. Um, I found interesting to note that that Colossae was, was known for the production of its, this rich wool cloth, this kind of red cloth, very expensive, luxurious cloth. And we'll see how that, I just found that interesting when we look at the passage we're gonna look at today, that Paul makes reference to clothing themselves. And I thought, I wonder if they would be thinking about that fancy red cloth that they were known for. So this letter, he writes, to the church because he has got wind of the fact that there are a lot of really wonky ideas that are coming into this church, that they started off well in their beliefs, but suddenly these ideas that were false, false teachers, false ideologies, just wrong thinking was starting to be knit in to what they believed. And it was really polluting their understanding of a pure gospel. And so Paul, from prison, he was, being, he was in prison when he wrote this letter. He writes this letter and has it sent to this church. And somebody would have read this aloud to this church. And so it would be like Paul speaking with love to this community of believers. And because we know it's a living word inspired by the Spirit of God, we can receive these words as a letter to us, to our own hearts, to our own church. And so we want to... We wanna have that posture today of receiving a word that's alive and true for us, applicable to us as a whole, applicable to our own individual hearts. So let's read to get context, Colossians 3, uh, right through to the passage we're gonna focus on today, just to give us context and to see where we've been. Ron preached a few weeks ago on the first part and Jeffy preached last week on the sort of second part of Colossians 3 and I'm gonna pick up the third part, but I thought it'd be good to just refresh and remind ourselves where we're at. So Colossians chapter three, starting in verse one. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. Here then there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, humility, sorry, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you are alive and you are seated on the throne. And we just thank you that the same spirit that raised you from the grave is alive in each life when we profess faith in you. And so we just thank you, Holy Spirit, that you can cause our hearts to be open, like ears wide open to hear what you want to say. And we ask that that would be our posture. Help us to have hearts that are wide open to receive to receive what you want to say to us as a church, to us as, as people. And I just thank you that your grace allows us to come to you and expect to have our Father speak to us. You love to speak to your children, and we just thank you for that. We just pray that your word would come forth with great vibrancy and life to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the passage that we want to focus on, Colossians 3. And there are three things that I see Paul really emphasizing, not only in this passage, but really throughout Colossians. One is that of identity. He's reminding these believers, okay, you have professed faith in Jesus. You say that you are a follower of Christ. Remember who you are. So he's getting at the core of their identity, reminding them what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He's also reminding them, when you say you're a follower of Jesus, your life should look different because of your faith in Jesus. This is not lip service faith. This is a faith that is confessed and lived out. Your allegiance should be visible, should be different. The way you live your life aligned with the way of Jesus. So he's calling their allegiance into focus, their devotion, the way they live their lives. And he's also reminding them of their destiny which is an eternal destiny because Jesus has conquered death. So we know that when, when we profess faith in Jesus, this miraculous thing happens where the very pattern that Christ lived on earth, which was one of surrender and yielding to the Father's will, the sense of being called to a mission to go to the cross and go blameless and holy to the cross, to lay down his life and let it be raised up in resurrection power. That same pattern is one that we live here on earth. We listen to the call of God. We lay ourselves down and we find that the Holy Spirit, that same spirit who raised Christ from the dead, is alive in us and working us over. I was thinking it's like wash, rinse, repeat. <laughs> it's kind of like that cycle of we come again to the Father and we lay down this part of our lives and he does this transformative work by his grace. And our destiny is eternal and we taste eternity by the spirit of the living God. We taste eternity in our lives. Whatever we yield to him, whatever we surrender, he will take that and breathe on it 
and bring life to it, new life to it. So these three things, but the one that I really want to focus on today is this identity piece, because to me, this is the one that if we don't remember who we are as followers of Jesus, it's really hard to live a life devoted to him. That's, when that happens, when we forget who we are in Jesus, our life starts to look like religion. It starts to look like meeting the requirements of the law without having a heart that is fully devoted to him. And if we aren't aligned with Jesus and if we've forgotten our, our identity, we don't have a sense of destiny or purpose here on earth. And so I wanna focus on this identity piece. And in particular, this verse, Colossians 3.12, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves, put on this new garment, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. When I was a kid, on Sunday mornings, the house would take on a, a particular tone. It wasn't Monday, get up and go to school. It wasn't Saturday, oh, morning cartoons. It was Sunday. So it was like, my mother would be knocking at the door and I'm like maybe you know six or seven and she'd be like, it's time to get to church. We gotta go to church. And it was like this, the Sunday morning machine would start and we would you know get to the bath, go comb your hair. And so there'd be this sort of, I don't know if anybody grew up with that sense of like, yeah, yeah, Adina's nodding, so you know. And so it'd be to the bath to get clean, to get ready for church. And then she would say, which dress do you wanna wear? And I just, oh, I hated dresses. Ironic, I'm wearing a dress today, but I hated dresses dresses. I hated the itchy tights that I had to wear and the pinchy shoes. And, and then she would make me, like I have to wash my hair, and then she'd make me sit under that big plastic cap of a hairdryer with the hose attached and the console, and she'd dial it high, and my head would be soft boiled by the end of the morning, but I'd have dry hair. And then she would bribe me. She'd say, can I curl your hair? And I was the kid who was like, don't touch my hair. I don't want to wear a dress. And uh, so she said, can I curl your hair? And so I'd sit on the counter in her bathroom, and she'd curl my hair. And I can remember her, she had a pack of juicy fruit gum in the drawer in the bathroom, because every time she burned my forehead, she quickly slipped me a piece of gum. She wasn't doing it on purpose. So I'd be, ow, here, have a piece of gum. So I'd be, you know, all readied up for Sunday morning church, the tights, the dress, my brother would have his corduroy pants on and his button up shirt and he'd be itching and we'd get in the car and we'd go to church and we'd, my mother would say, sit still and we'd sit still and pretty soon be kicking, no, sit still. So we'd be in our Sunday clothes, dressed, ready for the house of God, Sunday best, and, you know, hair combed, curled, burn mark hidden, um, chewing gum, and we'd sit there through the church service, and we would behave as best we could, Sunday best. And then as soon as we'd get in the car on the way home, the, you know, punching in the back seat with my brother, would, and we'd, you know, race home and take off our Sunday clothes and put on our, you know, jeans and t-shirts and be out in the yard riding dirt bike or, or something like that, <laughs> exactly. That's not the kind of clothing that Paul is advocating for the Colossians to put on. He's not calling for our Sunday best. He's calling for a completely different kind of clothing. And it's one that is actually the character of Christ. He's saying, since you have taken off the old clothes, the grave clothes, since you have taken off that nature, and you now have the nature, clothe yourselves with these qualities of Christ, and it's a clothing that becomes us, and we become by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I love that picture of sinking into this garment of Christ's character, and, and it's not something, it's not a Sunday best that we perform, that we get cleaned up. I want to say as an encouragement to all of us, we don't come to Jesus. We don't have to get clean to come to Jesus. We come to him because he cleans us. We come to him however we are, messy, broken, addicted, um, depressed, disappointed, wary, jaded, cynical. We come to him as we are, and he just says, come, come. And in his presence, we find ourselves clothed with his nature, and it's a beautiful thing. But there are three things that Paul points out in this particular verse, and they just resonate with the reminder of who you are when Christ is at the center of your life. 
First of all, he says, you are chosen. You are chosen. Do you remember what it was like to be lined up in gym class? And they're picking teams. And, you know, depending on the sport, I was never picked first for basketball, surprise. Um, Volleyball, eh, middle of the pack. But if it was something like, I'm trying to think of a sport that, like soccer, I was just, I was not a runner on the field. And you just don't want to be picked last. You know, as long as you're not picked last. Do you remember that feeling? Maybe you were picked first, good for you. The first shall be last, just so you know. I mean, the last shall be first, so I don't know. But if you, if you remember that feeling, I want you to just know that that is not what it means to be chosen by God. My understanding of being chosen by God, I think of, of is, is informed by when Paul is writing to Timothy. He says, God our, he refers to God our Savior who wants all men and women and children, all of us to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Being chosen means that the call of God, you've, you've said yes to the invitation of God. The moment you say yes to the invitation of Jesus, you're chosen. So the call is there for everyone. When we say yes, we're chosen. That's what it means to be chosen. Joel 2.32 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're wondering, am I saved? Call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And what does it mean to be saved? It means to be adopted into his family, to have that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead suddenly come into your life and start to work over all the parts of your life that are bound up, that feel dead. And he breathes on them, he brings life to them. And lest we think that, oh, we're so chosen. We're just the chosen ones. And you know, there can be that attitude sometimes in the church at large, like we're superior spiritually. Jesus is the superior one. And it's a good reminder in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things so that no one may boast before him. God's heart gravitates toward the humble and gravitates toward the lowly. And so if you have felt unchosen, unworthy, just know that that's that's where God's heart gravitates to. He gravitates to the ones who have been pushed to the side. I used to feel like there were certain people who were, there was like this spiritual hierarchy in, you know, in the church, like some people are more chosen than others. That's a lie, that's just a lie. It's an absolute lie. There is, n- when Paul is writing and he says here there's no Greek, no Jew, what he's calling out in the church is this sense of social hierarchy that is at work in the world. But when we come into the kingdom of Jesus, that's broken down. He's saying, it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you have adhered to all the Jewish laws or you don't, whether you're a barbarian or a Scythian. A Scythian, interestingly, that's basically, uh, that was what is today Russia in the Ukraine. That's where the Scythian tribes came from. And they were known to be highly barbaric people. And he's like, these people are all in this church in in, in Colossae. And slaves and masters are all gathering, men and women, where all the social hierarchies of the empire were at work in the world, they came into the church and he's saying, no, 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 no. What the world, how the world classifies people? No, Christ is in all. And he's saying that does not belong in the church. So if you have ever felt like you're somewhere down the ladder, or if you've ever felt conversely that you're, you're up here, the word to us today is that Christ is in all. And that spirit of unity, that bond of unity that exists in the body of Christ, it's a gift to us to remember that we humble ourselves before the Lord and we lift up the humble. You know, God lifts up the humble and we come alongside those. There is meant to be a beautiful, manifold witness of the nature of Christ in the church, which is different than the world. So you are chosen. I am chosen. We are chosen not because of anything we've done, but because God's voice has gone out into the earth with the good news of Jesus, calling to every human heart to lay our lives down and to be a people who profess Jesus as Lord. The other thing he calls us is holy. I did a poll last night. I said, how many of you feel really holy? So I'll ask you again today. 
How many of you feel really holy today? <laughs> no hands. <laughs> Who knows what happened here on the way to church, right? <laughs> Here's what it means to be holy. In Leviticus, this is the word of the Lord coming to his chosen people. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and follow them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. Two things really encouraging to me. One, to be holy is to just set yourself apart. And what does it mean to be set apart? Not that you have nothing to do with anybody else who doesn't love Jesus, but rather that you set yourself apart to the Lord. It means that you're not letting the sinful nature overtake you, but you are asking that the spirit of the living God would purify you and you are setting yourself aligned with the heart of Christ and the way of Christ. And it also is encouraging to hear that it is the Lord who makes us holy. We don't wait until we're holy enough to go to Jesus. He actually makes us holy when we're in his presence. This is sometimes the reason that people, I think, stay away from the Lord. They, they keep their distance from the Lord. I've had times in my life, and maybe you've had the same thing, where you, you kind of stand at the edge and, and, and there's a sense of, well, you know, I've professed faith in Jesus, and I'll just hang out here waiting for the glory train to take me to heaven when it's my time, you know, here on earth is done. That's not the life Jesus has called us to. He's actually called us to profess faith and then let that work of sanctification, time spent in his presence, drawing ever nearer to him, daily coming to him, moment by moment coming to him and letting him work over all the parts of our life that are dead, that still have the grave clothes on. I was thinking about that picture of the tomb and how Jesus went to the grave. It says he was wrapped in cloth, but when he was resurrected, he came out of that grave and he left the grave clothes in there. Sometimes I wonder if we as believers, we, we taste the salvation of the Lord and then we crawl back in our graves and we wrap ourselves up. And we might take a peek out every once in a while and the fear overtakes us about what it would look like and what it would feel like to have those wounds unwrapped, to have those grave clothes taken off. It's vulnerable. But let me tell you, there's freedom. I want to encourage you if you feel like you are stuck between the cross and the resurrection somewhere in that, that grave clothes space, there is more for you. There is more freedom for you. There is more life for you. God doesn't call us to sit in the darkness and wait for him to come. He actually calls us to come out of the darkness by his spirit and to come into the light. And there's healing there. I think sometimes we as Christians, we don't display the full abundant life of Jesus because we haven't tasted it. There are parts of our lives that are still bound up and the Lord is saying, come to me, I have more for you. And what does that mean practically? It might mean being bold and asking someone to pray for you. It might mean being honest about your doubt and saying, I have doubts, Lord, help me. Help my unbelief. It might mean that those old wounds that are there, that you just think, I will live with this until I die, and then Jesus will make it right. It might mean seeking out help and counseling and, and healing prayer so that the Holy Spirit can take those parts of our lives and, and bring resurrection life to them. So I want to encourage you. He's calling us to strip off the grave clothes and put on the new self, which is the, the nature of Christ. It's full of resurrection power. Why would we not? Romans 12, 1 says to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. To be holy is to set yourself apart and give your bodies over to the way of Christ. And that means saying no to certain things, appetites, desires, cravings, habits, addictions. It means bringing that stuff to the feet of Jesus and saying, what can you do with this mess? <laughs> And he'll say, you just watch and see what I can do with this. And 1 John 2, 6. This one's a convicting one to me. John says, whoever claims to live in him, in Jesus, must walk as Jesus did. 
He's not, I've sa- I said this earlier, he's not calling for lip service faith. He doesn't want a bunch of followers who only say the right things, but then live their lives however they please. He's actually calling for our lives to match the way of Christ. Um, This is the reason, this kind of verse here, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. It's why early on when I sort of began to follow Jesus, I'd grown up in the church, but walked away and came back to Jesus. I would, in my zeal, I put a, a fish decal on the back of my little Ford Festiva. It's a tin can on wheels. Um, and I was like, I'm a Christian. But then I began to realize that my driving habits and maybe gestures <laughs> weren't matching my profession of faith. So I pried it off the back of the car because I didn't, I just was like, oh, I think I'm giving Jesus a bad name. Whoever claims to live in him must drive as Jesus did. And I was, yeah, not that way. So, um, Praise be to the Lord who sanctifies all things. (laughs) Um, But it's that, I think it's the reason why sometimes we live quiet, faithful lives, not bold, sharing the gospel lives. Because there is a recognition that there's some stuff in my life I need to clean up before I tell somebody that I'm a Christian because, uh, you know, I don't want to give Jesus a bad name. How about we flip it? We just say, oh, Jesus, (laughs) We want to make you known. So purify all the parts of our lives so that our lives just look like you. They, they have the fragrance of Christ about us. And people say, why are you dealing with this situation this way? It's peculiar. And you say, well, let me tell you why. Because Jesus did this thing in my life. Um, our lives as a church, as people, should be the best bold witness and testimony of who Jesus is. It should not be just fish stickers. Nothing wrong with fish stickers on the back of your car. But... That's not, that's not what it means to walk as Jesus walked. It's actually living your life holy, set apart, devoted to the Lord. And he makes us holy bit by bit. Have you ever had that feeling of like, oh, now I've, I've kind of arrived spiritually. He's dealt with all the stuff that needed dealing with. And then, you know, a week goes by or maybe a day. And then he says, actually, there's this other area of your life where you really need to repent. And, and it's just, it's ongoing work. I want to encourage you if you felt like, will this ever end? Not until we meet Jesus face to face. (laughs) But we're all on that road of being purified and worked over by that pattern of death, that, that submission to Christ, the death and the resurrection. And that pattern just repeats in our life, in every part of our life, calling us to live in the power of the Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead. In Galatians, it says, I no longer live. I've been crucified with Christ. I have aligned myself with the mission of Christ. And now I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The Christ nature, the spirit of the living God is living from within me. And I used to think it meant that I was going to become a walking cliche. And I didn't want that. I was like, oh, I don't want to be a Christian cliche carrying around, I don't know, my precious moments figurines and, um, you know, wearing my, having my WWJD bracelet and like... I didn't want to be that walking cliche. And what I found to be true is that Jesus makes you more of who you are. He actually just calls out the person that you were destined to be more and more. So you become, I become more Carla as I, as Christ becomes more alive in me. You become more Anna Grace. You become more Scott. You become more Angela. You become more John. You become more of who you've been destined to be as Christ takes up more and more of your life, and it's a beautiful thing. And finally, dearly loved, not just liked, not just tolerated, not just put up with, not just loved, but dearly loved. This is who God calls you. He calls you dearly loved. I grew up with an impression, a wrong impression of God being ticked off at me all the time, just disappointed, just very disappointed. You're not up to snuff gold star, get your gold star. And that was the impression I had. And it's just not true. It's not true of God's nature. His posture toward you, his heart toward you is love, delight in you. And that should make us understand differently how to come to him. We don't hold back out of fear, ooh, cringing, what is he gonna say? Maybe we grew up with fathers who didn't seem delighted by our presence. God would say to you, 
I am a father of love. And he would say, come, come to me and find out how much I love you. I dearly love you. You are accepted in the beloved. There's nothing you can do to earn God's love. His love is just there because that's his nature. His nature is love. That helps me to come into his presence more freely and not hold back when I understand that his heart toward me is love. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins, all of the wrong of humanity, every wrong thing done globally, every wrong thing done individually. Jesus wore it. He took it on himself. I remember, oh, it'd be about 20 20 years ago, I felt this tug of the Lord to start sacrificing my early morning sleep in. You know, let's say the alarm went at, I don't know, quarter to seven. I felt like he said, I want you to get up earlier and spend time with me. And I was doing it admittedly out of kind of a sense of duty and ritual at first. Like I knew it was good for me. It was my vitamin (laughs) to get up 15 minutes earlier and just, I didn't even know, I guess I was going to read my Bible and just sit there and listen to the Lord. So I would get up. We lived in this little, used to be a chicken barn. um, They converted it to a little cottage and we we lived in this, uh, it was kind of a rural area. And I remember one morning getting up and just kneeling down. We had this picture window and it was still dusky or like still, the light hadn't come through the window yet. And I'm kneeling there and I have this really clear image of, it was, it was like a hand with, with a, a pen. And it was like I could see the feet of Jesus like hanging on the cross. And with this pen, this hand began to write on the leg, the skin of Jesus, words like lust, greed, pride. And I realized this was my hand writing these things. And as I was writing them, it was like the, the pen turned into a, a blade, and it was like I began this hand in this, you know, it's just in my mind's eye, but I'm watching this hand carve sin, my own sin, into the skin of Jesus. And it was just the Lord showing me this is what it meant that I went to the cross for you, that all your sin, all the things you struggle with, all that internal stuff, you know, you can live an externally great life. People say, such a nice person, but we know what goes on in our own minds and our own hearts. He took that, he took that on himself. He went holy and sinless to the cross. No other God has done that. No other God has done that. He went for your sin. He went for my sin. He went for the sins of the world, the unconfessed sins of the world. He took those on and he he brought them to the cross and he wore them for us. It was a transformative picture for me, just a realization of this was personal This wasn't a theory. This wasn't just a doctrine. Or this was personal. He took on my stuff, and in repentance, in turning to Him and asking for forgiveness, saying, "I'm sorry, Lord," He forgets them. He just—they're gone. He removes them. He doesn't see us as guilty anymore. His holy sacrifice makes us holy. It's not our righteousness. It's His righteousness. We put our—we put that on. We clothe ourselves in that. And that's an act of love, unlike any other God in this earth. There are a lot of religions. There are a lot of ideologies. There are a lot of things you can worship and devote your lives to. But no other God has shown love like this, that he would take on him the sins that we have committed out of love. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 14 and 15 says, for Christ's love compels us. That word is like, it it guides us, it directs us, it urges us onward. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. It's as if we all went to the cross when we align ourselves with Christ. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. We don't live our lives for us. The world will try to convince us that we are to live our lives, however we want. I think of it as the Starbucks syndrome, where you can custom order whatever you want. And that's the kind of mentality that we're taught this is how we should live. We customize our lives according to our own desires, which are often controlled by our own sin nature. And the way of Jesus is different. It says we actually are compelled and controlled and guided 
by the love of Christ. And that should cause our lives to look differently. When we have an awareness of how much God loves us, it turns duty into devotion. It's a complete shift in thinking. I grew up with religion. And I'm not saying that how I grew up, people, people loved the Lord, but my understanding, what came into my mind was religion, a list of requirements, a fulfilling of certain things you do and you do not say, things you do and you do not do. And as long as you could meet that, you were presentable before the Lord. But that's not the way of Christ. The way of Christ is that we, haven't, we come to him flawed, sinful, and we confess those sins, and he says, I, 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 I receive your confession, and I forgive you. And now we wear his righteousness. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. You're looking for a modern-day miracle, one that is as ancient and eternal as God. There it is, the great miracle that we can come to him, how we are, and he sees us as if we'd never sinned because we wear the righteousness of Christ. So, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, you are chosen. You have been called by God. If you have been in earshot of the message of Jesus, he's calling you. <laughs> or you've already received that call and you've been chosen. Here's a reminder for you today. You are chosen. You are chosen. And you are chosen to be part of something much bigger than your own life part of something God's doing in the earth, part of this miracle that he is doing in the earth. He's broadcasting the good news of Jesus. He is saying, come to me all you who are weary and I will give you rest. He's calling to those who are lowly and humble and cast down. He's saying, come in, come in, come in. That's the call of Christ. You are chosen by him to repeat that call to repeat that call, to let your life be the kind of witness that says, come in, come in, come in, because Jesus did that for us. You are holy. I know, you're not without sin. I am not without sin. But he sees us as holy, as saints, when we are in Christ. We are hidden in Christ. And he sees us as holy. And if that doesn't make us motivated to want to live the life, our true identity, to live that out, God sees us better than we see ourselves. So we should trust his definition of who we are. When he says, you are chosen, our, call, our answer should be, well, tell me what for. <laughs> when he says, you are holy, our confession should be, make me holy. Help me set myself apart for you because that's the true definition of who we are, and you are dearly loved. And so our cry should be, Lord, teach me to love others the way you have loved me. Teach me to lay down my life for the sake of the kingdom, for the way you have laid your life down for me. If this is the true definition of our identity, why would we not live into that? Why would we not live out of that? The world is in a mess when it comes to identity. And God is reminding us, you are chosen, you are holy and you are dearly loved. So let us live our lives in light of the truth of that, that identity, which is eternal and has purpose and reflects who Jesus is. If you feel like you're not chosen, if you feel the opposite of holy, if you feel like, how could God love me? You're not alone. And I was thinking about those Sunday mornings as a kid when I'm sitting there in my Sunday dress and my itchy tights and my pinchy shoes and my curled hair beside my brother uncomfortable in his button-up shirt. I was reminded of how my dad, who's, who came to church with us when we were younger, we went to this little Mennonite church, and he would, he would come with us until about the time I was four or five, and he just stopped coming. And he would sometimes, after he'd stopped coming, he would still get up in the morning and, and he would, I remember watching to see whether he would put on his Sunday clothes. And sometimes he would. He'd put on his, you know, the super pointy collar <laughs> shirt of the era. Um, he put on his polyester shirt. 
in his dress pants. My dad was a logger, so he didn't wear that clothing often. But he'd put, some Sunday mornings, he'd put on those clothes, put on some dress shoes instead of his work boots. And he would drive us to church. And we'd get to the church, and he'd say, I'm, I'm not coming in. And so he would drop us off, and my mom and my brother and I would go into the church in our Sunday best. And when we came out of church, my dad would be in the parking lot in the car, have the country music on. He'd be hiding a cigarette. And I think now, how I don't think he, I don't think he felt chosen. I don't think he felt holy. And I don't think he felt dearly loved. And it kept him back. I didn't understand at the time that that was, that was his understanding of himself, that his identity, he didn't know who he was in Christ. Right before he died, about almost nine, nine years ago, he came to faith in Jesus, and it was a beautiful thing. But then he didn't know who he was. And so I just want to encourage you, if you have felt I'm not worthy. Other people are chosen, not me. How could God love me? He's saying to you today, you are chosen. You are holy. You are dearly loved. Not because of anything you've done to earn it, but because that's his heart toward you, and that is the work of Christ in our life. So can we pray and just ask the Holy Spirit to remind us of who we are as a people, individually, but as a church too. Dear Lord, I just thank you that you love to remind us not of all the ways we've disappointed you, but you love to remind us of who we are truly in you and how you see us. You love to remind us of our, your heart toward us. So God, today I just thank you. We receive our true identity from you, which is that we have been chosen not because we are better than anybody, because you are a good God. And you love to draw people to your family. You love to bring children into your kingdom. So we just say yes to being chosen, and we say, we say yes to that invitation. Thank you, God, that you have chosen us for a purpose and that you have called us to live holy lives set apart, set apart for you, Lord. God, would you take every part of our heart that is guarded, that is not set apart for you, and would you just open it up, Lord? Would you strip off those grave clothes, and would you apply your resurrection life to those areas that need healing and transformation? I pray right now for anyone here today who feels bound up, like there's still part of them that's just dead, that's just wrapped up in grave clothes, Lord Jesus. I just pray that you would bring your love and your power, and apply the blood of Jesus to those areas of their lives. We just pray for, you'd show them what it looks like to get healing and to get freedom, Lord Jesus. Would you just guide, guide us all in that, in that process, Lord? We just set ourselves apart for you. And Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you that it reminds us, it reminds us that we are to love others. And so, Jesus, would you pour your love into our hearts that it might just flow right out of us, that it wouldn't be something we're mustering, but it just happens because we are so filled with an awareness of your love that we just want to give it away. And Lord, let those marks, the being chosen, holy, and dearly loved, set apart for you, Lord, would that mark us as image bearers of Christ on this earth, that people would see our lives and not think, oh, how good they are, but how good our God is. Let us be a people who say, who say, it's not we who live, but Christ who lives in us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.